Okay. So I'm I'm a little I'm a little scatterbrained today. Um, I had my big my big faculty review today, so I survived. Congrats. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, thanks to you guys, actually. Um, Dr. Dei Chen asked me. Um, Dr. Zhao asked me, um, why are my why are the evals so good this year for me? My student evals. And I said, thanks to you guys. So thank you for making my life easy. Um, I hope I make yours not too hard. Um, anyway, hydrogen. Yeah. So I, I kind of was I, I wasn't really sure how I wanted to tackle the rest of hydrogen. Uh, so I want to talk. We kind of stopped with wave functions. We haven't talked about the energy level, right? Energies in hydrogen. So I really want to focus in on that because we can talk about p orbitals and d orbitals and count, do integrals and do all of that junk that we did with the, the uh, uh, whatever call it with the particle in the box where we calculate average distance and momentum. We can do all of that for the hydrogen atom, and, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. But I don't really want that to be the focus of our study of hydrogen. Hydrogen's beauty is, I think, in some of its complexities and in, in, in its energy level structure. Right. What we learn from hydrogen from spectroscopy makes hydrogen very interesting. Right. From a wave function point of view, hydrogen is just prototypical. It doesn't, you know, it has these orbitals we know and love. You see them in all the atoms; they all look very similar. But there are complexities in the structure and the energetics of hydrogen that are, that are really cool, I think, in my opinion. Um, and we can learn a lot from them. And it tells us a lot about chemistry at all scales. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about, let's just finish up our wave function discussion a bit. Um, because now the question I, that I have, and this is a question we asked with the, with the particle in the box, is we have a state, a system, our electron is in a state of some sort in our, in our spherical box with an attractive potential in the middle. Right? And the question is, is what, where does the electron typically reside? As we said, as I showed, these wave functions are distributed across infinite distance. Right? The, the electron can be in a hydrogen atom anywhere, from the nucleus all the way out to wherever. And the question is, where does it stay on average? Right? Where, what, does, what does the average structure of hydrogen look like? Right? What's the size of its shell or of its cloud? Right? So the question we're going to ask today, very briefly, is what is the value of the average value of R for hydrogen. Right? Calculate R, average value. Right? We did this for the particle in the box. Right? We did this for position and momentum in problem set one. And so now I'm asking the same question for the hydrogen atom. When, how, on average, how long, how far away is the electron from the proton? All right, we're going to get a really lovely answer, really simple. Of course, it depends on which orbital you're in. As we'll find, as, as you get to higher and higher orbitals in energy, right? You go to n equals 1, to n equals 2, to n equals 3. The electron, on average, it goes further and further away, on average, from the, from the proton. Right? This n number is a radial number. It tells you how far something is on average. But the question is, is what, what does that look like? What, what, actually, what, what scale are we considering? Now, we, we should have a good sense of what the average distance should be. We know how long a bond is, for instance. We know that what we call the van der Waals radius of an atom, right? This, this, this kind of general idea of the size of an atom. But the size of an atom, of course, depends on what state it's in. If you prepare hydrogen in a 1s, the, the, the atom's going to look a lot smaller than it does when you're in the 4s or the 5s, where things are very far away. So it's interesting to ask this question. Okay, but we're going to come up, we have a complication now, mathematically is that when we did particle in a box, we were just doing one-dimensional integrals. Right? We're just integrating over the box. But now we have to integrate over a sphere. So if I draw, these are our old vector model for our hydrogen, our spherical coordinates that we set up for the problem. Z, X, and Y. And we're going to put our hydrogen somewhere. Here's our proton. Here's our electron at some distance. And now the question is, let's, let's let this electron move a little bit. So let's put a new position here. Say right here. 
And let's say that the angle that, that R makes with Z is theta. And let's make this angle between this, this, the, the original position of the electron and the next position, d theta. Right, so we're just going to move the electron just a little bit by an infinitesimal amount. Right, so the new angle it's at respect to z is theta plus d theta. Right, and let's ask that question about all directions. Right? Maybe we've made it a little bit longer. So maybe we've stretched it by dr. And maybe we've shifted it on the xy plane. Let's see if I can, if I can draw this just a second. Here's my original position. Here's what the projection looks like on the xy plane. This is phi. And then our new one could be, let me draw this with a straight line instead. So this is theta phi. And then ours is maybe a little further like this. Something like here instead. That's the new position. So we have this extra d phi here. So right, so the system has just moved slightly. So the electron has moved from the position r theta phi to r plus dr theta plus d theta and phi plus d phi. Right, we just moved it just a little bit in position. The question is, is what's the probability? The electron exists in the space bounded by these two rate, these two vectors. We want to calculate probability. Right? Ultimately, what we want to do, right? we want to calculate psi squared, and we want to integrate it over some region to calculate probability, just like we did with the particle in the box. But now we have to do it in three dimensions, and we have to do it around a sphere. Okay, so we know that for a particle in a box, probability is proportional to psi squared dx. It's one dimension. Right? And we can imagine you can put it in three dimensions. Right? Now you have a particle in a, in a cube instead of on a line. Right? So for 3D, probability is proportional to psi squared dx, dy, dz. Right? Just imagine we're taking one dimension and putting it into three rectangular dimensions. Three lines, right? So now this is a this is a line. And this is a cube. Right? You have a cube of volume dx, dy, dz. Right? This is the volume. Right? So what does this look like in spherical coordinates? Right? We need to convert this to theta, phi, and r. Right? Because our, our, everything's defined in terms of spherical coordinates, not rectangular coordinates. All right, so the question is, is what does this probability look like in these in these state in these values? Right. How does how does the cube the volume of a cube transform into a volume of a slice of a sphere? Right. So this is uh, instead of a cube, this is a spherical slice. Okay. So we have to come up with a conversion factor, just like we had to convert the coordinates from x, y, z to thetas, phi's, and r's. We also need to convert the volume of a cube into a volume of a spherical slice. And we could, and maybe you, maybe you did this in 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 in, in calculus three. I'm sure you did. Maybe you didn't. Um, but there's a really uh, there's a there's a natural way to convert between coordinates and calculate volume elements in different coordinate systems. Right, and I won't go through the process of doing that. Instead, I'll just write the result. It's not too hard to do this. You can look it up online from your math textbook. But if you take a, an element dx, dy, dz, right, so this is a cube volume. The way this converts into these angles is you get a factor of r squared sine theta dr d theta d phi. 
This is a spherical volume. Okay, so when we want to integrate something, we want to integrate psi squared around our circle to calculate probability. When we convert from a cube to our spherical coordinates, we always need to add this extra unit, this extra conversion factor, which is r squared sine theta. This is always going to be in our integral. Okay? So, I guess I have some room on the board here. So, probability in a cube is going to be the triple integral of the wave function squared times dx, dy, and dz. Right? We have to integrate over all three axes. And for a sphere, the probability is equal to the triple integral of psi squared again. But again, now we're in spherical coordinates, so we have to add an r squared sine theta dr d phi d theta. Okay, so there's always this extra r squared sine theta in your integral. Okay, so now we can we can we can we can now plug with this equation. We can plug in any wave function and calculate probability. We just have to remember that when we integrate through the bounds of our expression, that we have to add an r squared sine theta. Right? That's just converting a volume element. Right? That's always going to be there. Okay, so let's let's do an let's do an example calculation. Let's ask the question, what does the probability of finding the electron um, uh, as a function of radius look like. All right, so let's ask the question now, can, how do we plot the probability of finding the electron not across all three axes, but just along the angle, right? So as or the, the distance. So, so as we move the electron away, how does the probability change? Right, so naively, you would write just the radial part of the wave function and square it. So for instance, in the 1x or, 1s orbital, all right, we just have radial distance, or our x here is r over a naught, it's just r. We have just a function of r, right? So what if I just square this, and we'll be good to go? Well, the problem is, is that you're not actually representing the probability in 3D space that way, if I just square this and just go away. Because probability is proportional to how much probability you have in a volume. Right? And so your volume is always going to have this extra r squared sine theta term. So rather, probability of, of finding something at some distance x is going to be equal to psi of r equals x squared r squared sine theta. Okay, and, but notice that now we have this, this theta term here, right? But what we're gonna do is we can just integrate it out, right? What we're gonna do is we're gonna average over all the angles, right? All the thetas, right? Remember this, this the one s orbital is spherically symmetric. So I can just integrate it out, and I'll, I'll show you that, that process in just a second, so this goes away. So in general, if you wanna calculate the radial probability, you need to multiply it by r squared. Right, so for radial probability, probability is proportional to psi squared, r squared, r squared psi squared. Okay. Now let me show you why this sine theta goes away. So let's do this integral. I'm not gonna work it all out, we'll not plug it in, we'll just kind of look at it generally. So again, probability is going to be equal to the triple integral of psi squared, r squared sine theta, dr, 
d theta b. Okay, and so let's say that this psi is the 1s orbital, which means it's just a function of the distance. Right? There's no, there's no angular component there. Right? So we have a function. What we want to integrate to calculate probability is we have a function of r times r squared times some sine theta. Right? And then we have to integrate over the three bounds. But what we can do, because these are separable, we have a theta part that's separate from the r part. We can separate this integral and, and turn it into, instead of a triple integral, into three single integrals. Let me show you what I mean by that. So what we can do is integrate the theta part separately from the phi part, separately from the dr part, and do it all by itself. So we'll separate variables and rewrite this integral so that first you have an integral with respect to whatever one you choose, let's say d th phi, times the integral with respect to the next variable, let's say theta, so that would be sine theta d theta times the radial part, which is r squared psi squared dr. Okay. What you're going to find in all of these problems that when we want to integrate in 3D space, all a 3D integral is is just three single integrals that you separate like this, and they pick the product. Right? So this separation always works in this, in this class, pretty much. So you never have to worry about, does r change with does, does theta determine the value of r, right, if they're coupled degrees of freedom, right? If you move r, does theta and phi change? Is there some di dependence on them? And in fact, there's not. They're all separate variables. They're all separate directions. We call them or in the orthogonal, if you will. Right? They don't communicate to each other. Like x, y, and z, they're all separate. You can, you can define motion independently along x, along y, and along z. Here, you can define motion independently in terms of r, theta, and phi. Right? So you can separate them out. All we need to do now is define the bounds of this integral. And so if we want to integrate over the entire sphere, right, we want to integrate everything, then we need to just def integrate around the bounds of each of these variables. So r is defined, if you go back to your notes, r is defined from 0 to infinity. Like that's the length of the distance, so it can't be negative. Theta is defined between 0 and pi. Right, that would be pointing straight up all the way to pointing straight down on the z-axis. And theta can be any angle, so it's between 0 and 2 pi. All right, so now what I've done is I've taken this triple integral that's a function of three variables and converted it into three single integrals, a product of three single integrals along each of the coordinates. All right, and, we, and, and everything is, these are easily to integrate, right? We can get rid of this angular part immediately, right? Because the integral of d theta is just theta. And you go from 2 pi to 0, so this just evaluates the 2 pi. Right? Because you just get theta out, and it's 2 pi minus 0, it's 2 pi. This is the integral of cosine. I'm sorry, the integral of sine is cosine. So the integral is the cosine of pi minus the cosine of 0. And let's think about that. That's minus 1 minus 1. So that's minus 2, or that's 2. Right, that just integrates the 2. Right, let's say cosine of pi, we just double check, minus 1 times 0 times minus 1. That's actually minus 2. Yeah, it's 2, sorry. 2. And, and then so we're left with 4 pi, integral 0 to infinity, r squared sine squared dr. Right, so the angular part. For, for a system that isn't dependent on angle, the angular part is just 4 pi. Right? This is just, this is just the, the um, what would you call this? Um, kind of like the, the surface area of a circle, 4 pi. Right? The surface area is 4 pi r squared. r is 1 here. By definition, for this definition, you get 4 pi up. And then we're left with r squared sine squared theta. Right? So this is the probability distribution along the r direction. Right? This tells you the probability of finding the, the, the electron along any distance away from the nucleus at any angle. Right? And we know that this is nor we know that the wave function is normalized by definition. So this should ultimately equal 1. 
Okay, if we integrate over the entire sphere, it should be one. Okay, and in fact, those, the wave functions that I've put on the board or the ones that I've posted online are already normalized. So when you calculate this integral, it'll come out to, to one because you'll get a factor of four pi on this side and it'll cancel out, right? If you notice here, there's this factor of square root of pi here, one over eight, square root of eight pi that you see here. Those, fun those are actually normalizing this four pi that comes out of here. Right? This four pi is contained inside this coefficient right here. So when you do this integral, you just, everything cancels out and you get one. So the only difference between three dimensions and one dimension in our case is that you just, when you calculate probability, you're always going to add an R squared to it. Okay, R squared sign. So it depends if you have a, you can just get rid of the angle dependence if there's no angular dependence in your wave function. And then you can just get rid of this and you just have R squared. Or if there's angular dependence and you want to calculate something about angle, you're going to have to include the sine theta. Right? So this is for wave functions of no angular dependence, like the 1s or the 2s orbital. And for ones with angular dependence, there's going to be a factor of sine psi, psi squared on top of it. Right? So this is for wave functions with theta phi dependence. Okay, so the, so the math is very similar. It's just instead of doing one integral, we have to do three. Most of the time, the integrals are pretty straightforward, right? This, there's very few, there's only a couple functions that have dependence on phi. So typically, this just integrates right out. Um, and, and typically, in theta, of course, you just have sines and cosines. That's not too bad to do. But you do have this r squared integral that can be a little tricky. We're not going to do too many of these. I just kind of want to talk about it heuristically. Um, we'll look at some examples, and maybe on the next homework, we'll have maybe an integral question or two. But that's not really the point of the hydrogen atom that I care about. What I want to use this for is to now calculate, answer my question. What's the average value of R? All right, and of course, I have to define, I have to define what wave function, what state I'm in. Right, so let's just take a normal hydrogen atom and put it in a 1s orbital, right? That's exactly normal old hydrogen atoms that are floating around. Of course, hydrogen doesn't ex typically exist as a, a, an atom, it exists as a molecule, but just bear with me. We're going to, we'll just assume it's in a 1s orbital, right? That's the ground state. All right, so I'm going to define my wave function, which is only a function of r, as 1 over the square root of pi times Z here is the nuclear charge, which is just one for hydrogen, A naught. We haven't defined A naught yet, but we will. Three halves. E to the minus R over A naught. Okay. So there's our wave function. And now what I want to calculate is the average value of R. And this is going to be the triple integral of psi times r times psi, r squared sine theta d theta d phi dr. Right, again, I've, all I've done is the same thing I did before. When we calculate an average value, we take psi squared and we jam the operator in the middle. Right, and that's exactly what I'm doing. But because I'm doing spherical coordinates, I have this extra r squared sine theta there. Right, the volume element, so that's extra there. Right, and R, the R operator, the distance operator, just like before, the position operator is just the, the variable itself. So the way, the function that I'm going to have to integrate, let's just plug things in. And I haven't defined the bounds of my integration yet, but we will. They're, all the, they're always the same, by the way. Um, so this is going to be from 0 to 2 pi. 0 to pi, or sorry, minus pi, 0 to pi. 0 to infinity of 1 over the square root of pi times 1 over a naught to the 3 halves e to the minus r over a naught times r, right? That's our operator that we're jamming in the middle of psi squared. And we have the wave function again.
And then let's say we have dr, we have r squared sine theta, right? That always is there. And then what do we have first? Well, r is the first thing. The first integral is r, zero to infinity, zero to pi, that's d theta. And then the outside integral is zero to two pi, which is d phi. Okay, so here's our integral. It looks nasty, but we can simplify it quite a bit. Right? The nice thing is, is that notice that our radial wave functions are exponents, so these are really easy to integrate. Right? The integral of an exponent is an exponent. Um, and we can combine them rather quickly. So let's combine terms. So we have two square roots of pi. So we get the one over, we get one over pi there. We have one over a naught to the three halves squared. So that's a naught to the minus three. So this is a naught cubed in the denominator here. And then we have an integral in terms, let's do our, theta, our phi one first from two pi to zero of d phi. Right, that's easy enough to integrate. That's just four. That's just uh, two pi. And then we'll, we'll do our radial part, or not a radial part, our, ang our other angular part, the theta. That's going to be from zero to pi. And the only terms in terms of theta is the volume element, the sine theta, d theta. And then we have our radial part, which is the integral from zero to infinity of e to the r minus r over a naught times r times e to the minus r over an a naught. So that's e to the, that's, sorry, let me just start that again. And we have an r squared here, right? So we have r, r squared, so that's r cubed, e to the minus 2r over a naught dr. Okay? So we can immediately do this, right? We've already evaluated, this is 4 pi. So this is 4 pi over pi a naught cubed times r cubed e to the minus 2r over a naught dr from 0 to infinity. All right, of course, that, that, the, the pi's cancel out here. Right? That's probably a good thing that the pi's cancel out. We're integrating over a circle, so there shouldn't be any pi's left. We want to get rid of the angular part of our calculation, so the pi should go away. So we're left with this integral that's kind of frustrating. It's not the easiest thing to do. Now I can plug this into Wolfram Alpha. There's a closed form solution for this integral. In fact, all integrals of the form r to the x to the n e to the minus x are solvable. All right, but it's not the easiest thing you have to do. In order to solve this, you have to do integration by parts three times or two times, and that's not fun. All right, but I have an answer for this. You can look it up. So this basically transforms into an equivalent integral, which is 4 times the integral from 0 to infinity of x cubed e to the minus 2x dx. It's basically the same thing. I'm just kind of blurring my eyes. And I, anyway, you can look this up. This is I have a table of integrals on Canvas that has these solutions. You can do it in Wolfram Alpha. These are solvable integrals. They're not that hard to do. They're just tedious. I mean, what you find is that you end up getting 3 halves a naught. So the average value of the distance for the 1s orbital is 3 halves this number a naught, this constant. Now, what is a naught? A naught turns out, again, it should have, right, distance should have units of, of distance. So a naught has to be units of distance. Well, a naught, as I mentioned, I may have mentioned this before, is what's called the Bohr radius. And I have the value here somewhere. I always forget it off the top of my head. Yep, here it is. And it's uh, five, it's roughly, I'll say roughly, of course there's many more digits than this, 5.292 times 10 to the minus 11 meters. And I wanted to actually show you what this value means. And this is one of the most beautiful results about quantum mechanics, I think, is that 
the actual definition of the Bohr radius, which I have kind of, kind of, kind of glossed over. Yeah, that's what I thought it was. I think it's M E and alpha, right? M E E squared. So if we, if we represent the Bohr radius in terms of physical constants, this is equal to 4 pi times the permittivity of free space. This is an electro, electrostatic effect times Planck's constant squared divided by the mass of the electron times the square of the charge of the electron. Notice that the, 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 the length scale that the hydrogen atom exists at, right? And we can approximate that, right? If, it, if A naught is on the order of half an angstrom, right? And that angstrom is 10 to minus 10 is 0.5 angstroms, then it's on the order of 1.5 angstroms. This is a, a chemical length scale, if you will. Right? All of chemistry kind of functions. This is the fundamental length scale of chemistry, right? We've created the simplest atom. We've put it in its ground state. And we say, what's the, di what's the difference? What's the average length scale of the interaction of electrostatics? And then the ground state, it's 3 halves A naught, 1.5 angstroms. Well, there's a good reason why most bonds tend to fall around this, this order. Because when you share, when you have two hydrogen atoms come together, they're going to share electrons, and those electrons are going to be roughly around the length scale that they exist on around the proton, and that's 1.5 angstroms. And so when you put them together, the bond length of hydrogen is around an angstrom, H2, and right, we've already predicted that we're, it's good, the bond length should be on this scale. Right? There's no reason for it to be any larger than this, because the electrons aren't going to really leave their protons um, unless you put a lot of energy into them. So bonds and interactions should be on this length scale. And the length scale is determined by fundamental constants, right? The electron, the existence of the electron, its size, how much charge it has, and the, the electrostatic capabilities, if you will, of the vacuum of space, if you will, define the length scale. Right? So this, these, these things are finely tuned. Right? Imagine if we changed any of these by a little amount, then, our, then chemistry would look very different. Right? Because the length scale, the, 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 thing, the distance at which chemistry happens is completely dependent on this, the magnitude of these constants. So if we lived in a different universe that had different constants, we would have very different length scales. Right? So chemistry is, chemi the chemistry is defined solely by the electromagnetic constants of the universe. There are other ways to represent the Bohr radius in terms of constants that are a little simpler than this, but we've seen all of these already, right? The mass of the electron, the charge. We saw this epsilon when we talked about the electrostatic potential, and we've seen H a million times. Right? So, right, so everything is set fundamentally by the constants. This is a really good thing, right? This, this, is, very ha this is good for us because we, we build up a model of, of how the universe works. We come up with a set of constants, right? How fast does light move? How attracted are positive and negative charges to each other, right? Um, what's the size of the particles involved in this material, involved in this interaction? And when we calculate differences of them and, and put together interpreted constants or, or kind of adapted constants from them, like the length scale, we get things that make a lot of sense, right? And so these things are interconnected with each other. Chemistry is defined purely by electrostatic effects. Right? How the length scale of chemistry happens is solely dependent on the electromagnetic interaction. OK, so this is why that A not such an interesting number, is that it's, a, it's, kind of a, it's kind of the constant for chemical length scale. right? So when we talk about how something is distance in terms of uh, its way from the nucleus or how strong a bond is and stuff, we're always going to reference things relative to this scale. Imagine that when we talk, for instance, when we talk about intermolecular attractions, things like hydrogen bonds, we always think about hydrogen bonds on the order that are four angstroms or five angstroms are very weak, 
because there are very large scales compared, very large distances compared to the chemical length scale that we can calculate. But things that tend to have bond lengths on the order of 1.5 angstroms tend to be very strong because they're on this chemical length scale, right? They're at the length scale where the electromagnetic attraction is maximal, if you will. So all of this is all buried, is all dug in. It's all encoded, right? It's all encoded in the fundamental constants of the universe. It determines where chemistry happens, right, in terms of length. Now, I'm not going to do too many of these in this class. Because we can, we can calculate how R changes as we go to higher and higher orbitals, and you'll find that it gets, the electron gets further and further away uh, from the atom as you go up in orbitals. As n increases, the average distance increases. Um, and so maybe I will look at that on the homework, but I don't really want to focus on it too much. Yeah, in fact, I'll write down right now the average value if you plug in constants in your, your state, in average, it, it turns out to be A naught N squared divided by the photon, the charge of the nucleus, 1 plus 1 half, 1 minus L, L plus 1 over N squared, like this. So as, as, distance, gets, as distance gets bigger, as sorry, as n gets bigger, as the electron gets more and more excited, on average, it go, the distance increases at n squared. Um, but there's this balance between angular momentum and, and distance as well. So eventually, your, your distance starts to get a little smaller because n squared starts to, oh, no, it doesn't, actually. It starts to level off, now I think about it. So as you, if you have a, a system that's an n, if you make n go really large, right, this, base, this term basically goes away. And so you're basically proportional to n squared. But as you start to kick in angular momentum, the system gets further and further. This number gets big. And so the system actually starts to draw itself away even more from the, from the proton as you start to spin it up. So this is how spinny, something, how spinny the electron is. And this is its uh, average excitation how excited it is. Right? So you can excite an electron and make it further, stretch it further and further away, but you can also spin it up by putting a d orbital or an f orbital, and that will draw the electron away from, from the atom due to centrifugal forces. Professor, in that yeah. equation, you said z is the charge of the electron. Yeah, so for, for the height, uh, sorry, z is the charge of the proton, the yeah. nucleus. So z here is one for the hydrogen atom. But you could, you could for helium, it would be two, for instance. Um, and that's how it changes. But the, regardless, the, the, exactly what you would think is if the electron gets more and more excited, you're pulling it further and further away from the nucleus. And as you start to spin it up more and more, you get centrifugal forces and you start to stretch that attraction, right? Because you start to spin the electron, the average distance wants to stretch from centrifugal forces, and that's what's encoded in here. Okay, but I, I don't really want to focus on that any more than this. Right, this doesn't really tell us much about the hydrogen atom. Now, of course, the, the, the shape of the orbitals is important. Right? When we get to molecules, we'll really start to think about shape. Um, but the really cool thing about hydrogen is its energy level structure. Right? I haven't said anything about energies yet. OK. Any more questions about this? All right. OK. Let's talk about energies. And we're going to focus on this for a couple more lectures, at least one more on top of this, maybe two. So well, again, I have not written down our energy formula for the, for the hydrogen, right? What's the energy of the electron as a function of n or l? Right? And an interesting observation turns out energy of, elect of hydrogen is only dependent on n. All right, so if I were to write the, if I, I'll write now, I'm going to write the energy formula for, for hydrogen. And you get this really big set of constants on the outside. It's the mass of the electron times its charge to the fourth power, 32 pi squared, epsilon naught squared, h bar squared, 
times 1 over n squared. Right, this is just a constant. Right? So in fact, the energy is proportional to 1 over n squared minus 1 over n squared. It's interesting that there's a minus sign there. We'll think about that for a second. In a second. OK, so this is very different than the particle in the box. The particle in the box, energy was proportional to n squared. Right? Remember, the energy is h squared n squared over 8 ml squared. Right? So as, as n increases, E increases. But notice here, as n, as n increases, E decreases, as 1 over n squared is. Right? So what, what, what do we have? So let's ask the question, what happens? What's the ground state energy? All right, so let's ask, what is E1? Well, that's just going to be this big constant minus this big constant times 1 over n squared. So we'll call this this big constant, 5 by 1 squared minus, so this is equal to minus C. Right? So the, the energy of the ground state of hydrogen is, the, is this constant right here. And in this constant, Me e to the fourth, 32 pi squared, epsilon naught squared, h bar squared, is what's called the Rydberg constant, named after the man who discovered it. And it has a very specific value. All right, I'm just going to write the value down. You'll never have to write all these equations, all these constants down or evaluate it. I'll just give it to you. So when electron volts is 13.6, and then wave numbers, it's 109773.731 wave numbers. So what this means is that the energy of the ground state of electron of the of the electron is minus 13.60. Now what happens as I start to increase the excitation? How does the energy change? Well, now this minus this 13.6, so I'll just rewrite it like this. Right, 13.6 minus 13.6 divided by n squared. So here, let's write n equals 1 here. This is our n equals 1 state. This is at minus 13.6. Right, n equals 2 is going to be a fourth of that, right? Because now you have. 13.6 divided by 2 squared, which is 4, which is minus 3.4 eV. Right? And we can keep going up. So n equals 3 is at minus 1.1511 eV. n equals 4 is at minus. 0.85 eV, right? And if you notice, as we start to get higher and higher energies, the spacings between them get smaller and smaller and smaller. Right? The gap here is whatever this is, like 12 eV. Right? It's a big difference. But here's only the next one, 2 to 3, is only 1.5 or 2 eV, right? And then this one's only the difference between these two numbers, 0.7. So the gap is getting smaller and smaller. Right, so as n goes to infinity, the energy level difference goes to zero. Right, so what that means is that, that we have, we, as we keep doing this, they get closer and closer together, but they never reach zero. If I put zero EV here, we're going to have levels that get increasingly closer and closer to zero EV, but never quite reach it. You can show that, right? The only way that this is ever going to equal zero is if n is infinite. Right? It's going to get increasingly closer. So how do we interpret this physically? Well, the assumption is, is that at zero EV, remember that the, the electron 
is attracted to the proton. And, and, and in this case, attraction is equal to negative energy. What does that mean? It's, it means that that implies then that zero EV implies we've taken hydrogen and we've split it into a free proton and a free electron. Basically, zero EV is where there is no attraction between the proton and the electron, infinite distance. All right, so what, that means we can immediately make a prediction. Is that the amount of energy to take an electron from the 1s orbital and kick it out of hydrogen is 13.6 eV. Right? So what this limit is, is basically how much energy you need to put into your hydrogen atom to keep the electron out. Right? The system is attracted to you by this much. So you need to put in that much energy to kick the electron out. Right? So this would imply that the ionization energy of, of hydrogen in the 1s state is 13.6 eV. And I guarantee you, go look it up online, it's 13.6 eV, it's the exact answer. This is exactly right. Exactly correct. Okay, so the really cool thing about hydrogen is that, it, that no matter, as long as you don't put in that total amount of energy to ionize it, you can put the electron in any state you want, and it will still be bound. As long as you're not giving it more than 13.6 eV, right? So I could be at 13.599999 eV, and my electron is still technically bound to my hydrogen. Okay, once it's past that point, then I have a free electron, a free proton, and all hell breaks loose, right? But I have this ionization. So th that leads to really interesting effects spectroscopically, because depending on which levels I want to look at, so if I want to look at an absorption of hydrogen between the n equals 2 and n equals 1 level, I would need something, a light source that's on the order of this difference. There's a lot of energy. This has to be well calculated. It's like on the order of 300 nanometers. You need UV light for this n equals 2 to n equals 1 transition absorption. But imagine if I was at n equals 100, and I want to look at the difference between n equals 100 and n equals 99, that absorption. Well, I would be at a much longer wavelength or much shorter frequency. Right? It turns out it's in the millimeter wave. It's on the order of a wave number or so, a couple hundred or tens of wave numbers. You need a very different set of light. So hydrogen turns out to be a, an absorber at a huge continuum of different, rate, of different frequencies or different wavelengths. Right? You can look at hydrogen with visible light, with UV light, or you can ionize it with UV light. You can look at small differences for very excited Right? That's one of the cool things about, I think one of the coolest things about the hydrogen atom in this structure is that when you get to really, really excited atoms, right? When you look at, you, you pump that hydrogen electron full of energy and it's just flying around there, N equals 100. You would think that, well, in order to do spectroscopy, I need to be at high energy. But the fact of the matter is, is that the energy level spacing gets smaller. So the wavelength, the frequency that you need to probe these levels up here is much smaller, the way the frequency up here is much smaller than the frequency you need here, right? So for, for fundamental transitions of hydrogen, absorption is the most common absorption. I'll talk a little bit more about those. You need visible light. And if you wanna look at really excited states of hydrogen, in order to probe those, you need microwaves, right? That seems counterintuitive. You would expect that you would need a high energy light source to understand high energy physics. But in fact, it's the opposite because of this one over n squared. Right? So people who study very excited atoms tend to do things at very low frequency because the energy level spacings are very small at high energy. Of course, they need a lot of energy to get an atom up here. But in order to probe that spectroscopically, you need low frequency right? because of this inverse relationship. Right, and these, these transitions of hydrogen, basically the absorption lines of hydrogens, have uh, famous names. I want to talk a little bit about them. All right, so one of the cool things about hydrogen 
is that the theory of hydrogen's absorption lines, right, where these show up, and the kind of the models that people have for how this works, was determined way before this ever was exactly solved by Bohr and all the quantum mechanics people. Right? The theory of hydrogen absorption lines is actually pre-quantum mechanics. They didn't understand why it worked that way. And there's a lot of things they didn't predict, as we'll learn. Uh, but people were already understood these things pre, well, a couple hundred, maybe 100 years before quantum mechanics, maybe 50 or 60 years. So I want to talk a little bit about the different types of absorption lines that you find in hydrogen. I'm going to define, I'm going to redraw my energy levels diagram. So here's our, our ground state. I'll write N on the left side and energy on the right side. And here's my N equals 2 level. And then we'll write N equals 3 here, 4 here, 5, 6. Anyway, that should be enough. And I'll write the energies. This is minus 3.4. Minus 1.51, minus 0.5, minus 0.54, minus 0.3. Okay. Okay, so here's our energy levels of hydrogen. These are exact. And these aren't predictions. These are the exact numbers, and they come out of the formula we've already commented, right? These are the numbers you get out of that n squared formula. And look, and, and typically absorption lines in, in, in hydrogen, and we do this for many atoms, is we define a set of a set of states that we do absorptions from. So imagine we look at all of the transitions or absorptions where we take an electron from the n equals one state and we put it up into one of the other ones. And so for instance, maybe we uh, the absorption or the emission that we're looking at is the two to one or the three to one, or the four to one, or the five to one. We call these the Lyman series, after the discoverer of them, Lyman. Right? And so the N equals M to one transitions are Lyman series, are called the Lyman series. A very common term for them. And we can think about what the, what the, what is the, now interestingly, let me make sure I have this right. If we think about the, the wavelength that we measure these at, okay, the one that has the shortest wavelength or the highest frequency is going to be the line with the highest final number, right? So where n is, n is largest here, right? But, the, but there's this main line right here. 2 to 1. Um, and this is at, this is what's called Lyman alpha. So this, so the n equals 1 to 2 is called the Lyman alpha line. And it's at, well, 121, sorry, 121.6 nanometers. All right, so it's in the UV. This is UV. Okay, and, and Lyman alpha, the, the, for instance, the sun. The sun emits tons of Lyman alpha. Every, almost everything, well, actually everything emits Lyman alpha. Uh, in astronomy, it's very common to, to tune your, do I have this right? So, 1 to 120, 26, 8, it's 1, yeah, yeah, this is right, 121.6, that's right. Um, so, very, it's very common to do astronomy at 121.6 because literally everything just lights up. All, every hydrogen atom in the universe pretty much will, will absorb this frequency difference. It's the most common one, right? It's literally the simplest transition you can have, two to one, and it's at the, in the UV. So hydrogen largely is a UV emitter. Um, right, and so we can keep going up, right? The, the three to one transition is the Lyman beta. which is at 102.6 nanometers. Right? And you can just keep, right, but the, the, this wavelength is, the change in the wavelength is gonna get smaller and smaller as we go up because the spacings are getting smaller. 
So the maximum line, the limit, which is n equals infinity, if you will, to n equals 1, is at 912 angstroms. Okay, so that this is the line where you have basically hydrogen is right near its ionization point and it's releasing all of that energy to drop down to the ground state and that transitions at um, 91.2 nanometers. Let me keep my units names. Right. So if you were to shine your UV telescope at any hydrogen source, or if you get a, you can buy light, you can buy lamps that, that excite hydrogen to emit line and alpha. It's a pretty common thing you can buy. Um, what you would find in your spectrum, so we'll do wavelength versus intensity. We would see a line right here. This is at 1216. This is the alpha line. This is in, sorry, this is in angstrom storm or nanometers, 121.6. And then there will be a big gap until the next line at 102.6. That's the beta line. And then there'd be a slightly smaller gap. And then it would just slide, and then you would see a convergent sequence of lines like this. Right? That ultimately get narrower and narrower until they hit the limit of 912 or 91.2 nanometers, and that's the limit. Right? So beyond that point, beyond this point, you have hydrogen plus. You've removed the electron. Right? So this is n equals 1 to 2, n equals 1 to 3. N equals 1 to 4, N equals 1 to 5, and so on and so forth. Right, but every, all of these lines are bound hydrogen. And once you hit that limit point of 91.2, your electron's gone. And now you're just left with proton plus electron, or hydrogen plus, however you want to think of that. Right, so you see this beautiful, right? And, and so this was actually observed. Way, like 1840s. Right? People started looking at people like Fraunhofer and some of the other early astronomers. Um, once, once we understood electro, electrostatics and electromagnetism, stuck their, high, their, their telescopes or their, their prisms and looked at, at light on the hydrogen atom and saw these series of lines. Um, and um, right, they saw instead of seeing a, right, they, they do a diffraction, they basically put the light in through a prism they expect to see a rainbow, but instead they see periods of the blue intermittently having absorption lines where there's no blue being emitted, right? And they have this weird pattern. Right? So they were very concerned about this. Um, and, and Lyman and Balmer and a number of the other guys, they don't, again, they don't have any understanding of, they don't even know what an electron is, much less a proton, right? Or anything like that. Right? They barely have any understanding of these things, but they see these series of lines in their, in their astron astronomical spectra. And they come up with, a, with a, uh, an empirical theory to, to explain or describe these patterns. Right? And they actually solve for this energy level structure empirically. They have no concept of the physics, but due to their experimental research, just being able to have these spectroscopic lines, they're able to, to come up with this energy level structure and come up with the idea. Right? It was around 1880, 1870, 1890, that Rydberg says, he looks at all this data and says that the energy of, of the hydrogen atom is minus 13.6 over n squared, right? They, they, just by doing spectroscopy, doing experiment, doing astronomy, they're able to come up with this idea, right? But they have no concept of why it is, no concept of even what a proton is, much less an electron. Um, but that's the power of spectroscopy, right? We can, we can see these energy levels, the structure, that shows this convergent sequence, and that must say mean that the energy levels are not equally spaced, that there's some convergent sequence of energies that can be accessible or not anything in between. Okay, how much time do we have? A few more minutes. Cool. So there, there are other series, right? The linemen are called any, the, the one transition, right? Anything to one. But there's also a series of everything that goes to two.
And this is called the Balmer series. And this is one that's much more common to look at because if I remember correctly, let me see if I have it here. Um, yeah, the maximum wavelength that you get from this, basically the longest one, the limit is 365 nanometers, which is visible. Okay, so if I were to extend my, my axis system here, for hydrogen, I would see a big long blank. There would be nothing there. And then suddenly at 365, I would see a series of lines that are converging towards 365. They get longer and further and further apart as we go. Right? This is the Balmer series. Now I have the Balmer alpha line here somewhere. And I always forget what it is. But anyway, it's in the visible. I think it's on the order of 600. I think this is uh, three, three So it's about it's about two eV. Yeah, it's about three. It's about 650. So this is the Balmer alpha which is the n equals 2 to 1. And this would be the n equals, or sorry, the, sorry, the 3 to 2, sorry. This is the 4 to 2, and, and so on and so forth. Right? And this is n equals infinity to 2. All right, so there would be this huge, so when you, look at, when you look at a pure hydrogen signal or sample, there's this whole gap in between the Lyman series and the Balmer series where nothing interesting happens. And that's because you've gone from, you have to make up this huge gap here. Right? This gap here between the n equals, the lower states, n equals 1 and n equals 2, is huge. All right, it's almost 11 eV. That's um, a lot of energy. All right, so, but as you keep going, you see another series called the Balmer series. And you can imagine there's another series that terminates at n equals 3, and that's called the Poshin series. Poshin series, that's the three series. And I think the maximum for that is like, I have it here, 821. So it's almost in the, in the infrared. So that difference is about 0.3, so that's about 1,200 angstroms. So if I were to continue this spectrum, I would see another huge gap until, what did I write, 821. There would be another limit series here, which is the Poshin series. All right, something like that. And this would be somewhere on the order of, I think, about 10 to 50 nanometers. I don't remember the exact number. So this is the N equals uh, 4 to 3. Right? And so if you were to shine, if you had a light source that could go all the way to UV and all the way out to, right, this is uh, near infrared or very, very red, I don't think you can actually see 1050, um, but it would be very, very red, right? You have, but you have these huge gaps, right? And so you can imagine, what well, you can imagine if you overlay this with a rainbow, we have blue here. My right? blue starts kind of. Uh, let me draw with the right color. <laughs> right, so blue tends to be about 220, 240. Blue is the start of the visible, and the end of the visible is around 900. And of course, that's going to be red. Let me draw it in red. Of course, this is pink, you'll have to forgive me, but that's right. Right, so if you imagine you have a rainbow here that goes blue, violet, green, blah, 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 blah. Right, and you, you distributed that and you're, you know, you're getting light from the, the, the sun or sort of any sort of global light source, white light. And you have hydrogen in the middle, you're gonna find discrete lines where that light's not being transmitted, right? You're gonna find blackout regions of the rainbow, right? These absorption lines. 
right? And it was very interesting to, to it was a big issue in the 19th century where they expected hydrogen to absorb kind of in an average way, but instead what they see are these series of lines that converge to a limit, and then there's nothing, and then they see another series of lines that converge to a limit, and then there's nothing, and then they see another line convergence, convergent series of lines like this, right? And so it took them about 30 or 40 years to figure it out, but they eventually realized that these are all from the same atom and that they all correlate to a series of transitions in this energy manifold of these decreasing, getting these lines that get closer and closer together, right? And you get this nice structure from this, all right? The reason why they're all named different names is that when they were discovered, they each, that people thought that each were a different atom, a different species, right? They didn't realize that the Passion series, the Balmer series, and the Linus series are all correlated to the same atom. They thought they were three different absorbers, right? And so they named them three different things, but in fact, we know that the only difference in them is just the final state, right? This is all hydrogen, right? And so hydrogen has this beautiful structure from this, right? And, and if you can imagine, this just keeps going. Right? You can go now instead of the Poshin series, you can do the start of n equals 5 and then n equals 6. Right? And we're going to see this series of sequential lines. Right? Eventually, we might even get to something like, um, let me think about this, uh, 10,000 nanometers. And you're going to see a limit like this. And it looks exactly the same. But now it's shifted all the way, and this is the n equals 100 to some other state, right? This is, this is the n equals 101 to 100, and this is the n equals 102 to 101, or 100 rather, and this is the n equals 103 to 100, and, and so on and so forth, right? And so we can, we can see hydrogen shows up everywhere, right? Because of this convergent limit a cycle, or this set of infinite states that it has, that converge towards a singular value. You get these nice progressions that are separated by the difference, the separations of each of the final states. And this is n finally goes 100. Right? All right, so I, this is one of the things that really attracts me to spectroscopy is, is that we're learning something very complicated about, about, about energy here and about the hydrogen atom, right? Everything about the hydrogen atom is, 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 is about the structure of it is, is in these lines. But when you break it down like this, all you see here is the same pattern over and over and over again. But the only difference is, is that the gap between the progressions closes in. It turns out that this gap is larger than this gap, which is larger than this gap in energy, right? So you have a series of convergent lines, and then another series of convergent lines, and then another series of convergent lines that's even closer, and then another one, and then eventually they're just like right on top of each other, like that. Right? You see these patterns, right? And this is one of the cool things about spectroscopy, and what, what really drew, draws me to spectroscopy is that this idea of a pattern is, is intrinsic to a molecule or an atom spectrum. And we can learn a lot about the structure of the atom by just doing pattern recognition. Right? As, we'll find, as you'll find is that as you start to change atoms, you go from, from helium to hydrogen, hydrogen to helium or lithium, you see, these same, you see these same series of lines. The patterns are exactly the same, but the energy, sp the spacings between the lines or the spacings between the progressions changes, right? Because the structure of the atom is slightly different but the patterns are precisely the same. Right? These patterns, so patterns in some ways spectroscopy is pattern recognition. In general, patterns are invariant to atomic or molecular structure, right? they share these, these, these structures, these patterns, right? these patterns of convergent lines. 
differences in atoms or differences in content and material are determined by the relative spacings of the patterns. Or lines. Okay? So if you start to do more complex atoms, you don't of course the way that the lines are slot up change, right? Things shift around, spacing to individual pattern sequences changes, there might be slight perturbations. But in general, you have this, this clearly defined pattern like this for every atom that looks like this. Right? And it doesn't matter if it's hydrogen or uranium, you get these patterns. Okay, and that's one of the really cool things about, this is what I mean, I drive home that, that chemistry is not, there's not, there's diversity in chemistry, but the diversity of the way that chemistry is structured, how atoms are structured, how molecules are structured, are very universal. Right? It's, it's the, the actual, the, the structure at zero order, the simplest structure that, of, of energy, if you will, is, is, is universal across all materials. The things that make different the materials different is, is kind of the fine structure, the fine space things, right? How is the relative spacings of the patterns change? And that tells you a lot about the material. But from this perspective, every atom will look the same, right? which is kind of cool, I think. It's kind of a really powerful, powerful universality to chemistry. Okay, so I have about two minutes left. I just have one more comment. And the comment is, and what we're going to start with next time is we're going to find that this model for hydrogen's energy level structure is flawed. Well, we'll see these lines. Don't get me wrong. Where these lines show up is exactly what you see. But let's imagine now that you have a very high resolution spectrometer where you can, instead of stepping one nanometer at a time, you can step hundreds of nanometers at a time. And what we're going to find is that when we take this line right here and we zoom in on it, it's not a line. It's actually a doublet. Right? So, in fact, what, what's going so what uh, there's actually a finer structure to the energy levels. That there's there's a splitting here that the any the Balmer line. So this is the Balmer line. This is the two to three to two. There's actually two transitions there. So in fact, what we might find is that there's actually not just one line here, but two lines here and another line here maybe. And we're seeing this one and this one. They're pretty close in energy difference because the lines are very finely split. But if we zoom in enough, we'll see that these lines are doubled. And in fact, if we zoom in even further, we'll find that, um, let me think about this for a second. Um, well, it depends. But I think that this line turns into Turn, in fact, this, these doublets turn into, each of these doublets turn into a, another doublet. It's actually a doublet of doublets if we zoom in further. So there's four lines there. There's four states. Right, and the question is why that is, right? And this wasn't discovered. Balmer and Poshin and, and Lyman, all the older astronomers, and, and they didn't have the resolution for this. But coming into the, two, the 20th century, people started to have the resolution. And they were starting to look at lines of, of hydrogen and noticing that they're split. So there's a splitting there, which means there's two states, not one. So there's something flawed about the way that we've constructed this energy level diagram. All right, we're only counting for certain states. All right, so there must be something more fine about the hydrogen that we're not noticing. All right, so we'll talk about that next class on Monday. Um, and what we'll learn is that, just a little spoiler, um, we haven't accounted for spin yet. So we're going to count for spin, and we'll find that that helps us. All right, have a nice weekend. I'll see some of you tonight. Have a good day. Yeah, you too. Thank you.